Hey guys, Luminous here, and welcome back to my channel. We are going to go and play The Last of Us Lost Levels. They weren't in the game. They got removed at the last minute. And there is the Jackson Party, Seattle Sewers, and the Hunt. Basically, Jackson Party is when she's going to the party to meet Dina. And Ellie nervously attends a party in Jackson and uh yeah this part wasn't in the game and if you got the remastered ps2 version which i just got yesterday it took me a while but i got it on my ps5 uh this is the remastered version and basically whoever got the remastered version can play these playable uh parts of the game so uh basically that's jackson party then this is the seattle sewers uh the part when she was in this building and getting pursued by clickers and runners and whatever else was there. Uh, Ellie is swept into this Seattle sewer system, and basically she ended up in the sewer, and this part wasn't into the game as well. Then the hunt, basically, Ellie follows a trail of blood into an abandoned general store. Basically, she was chasing a boar, and she was trying to kill it, you know, for food. But, uh, yeah, things didn't go as planned, it, and which it wasn't in the game as well. So, uh, why I'm playing these right now is I'm doing it because if people never seen them, I am trying to share this out to, uh, you know, just let people to be entertained by it and enjoy it. But, uh, yeah, soon I will be doing part one and part two of The Last of Us. At the first of the gameplays, I will speak. But during the gameplay of the of those games, I don't think I will be speaking because it's going to ruin the storyline and it's already got, you know, talking in the game. And I just don't want it to be complicated with me speaking over it. I hope you understand that. But yeah, I will be playing Part 1, Part 2 Remastered on the PS5 very, very shortly. So uh, yeah, let's just get into the Jackson Party. So uh, what I was going to say is I'm going to go do two separate parts of the Seattle Sewers and the Hunt after this gameplay. Um, the reason why I am going to do the redo of the Seattle Sewers and the Hunt is because there is commentary of the character talking and you can't really hear it over the person who talks about the game. There's parts of the game where you click on it and it talks about certain areas. So Jackson Party don't have any commentary. Uh, just you just hear the people that made the game talk about certain areas and uh, the Seattle sewers and the hunt you can actually hear the character speak so I'm going to go do those part two parts separate after this video so I hope you all enjoy let's just get into this Originally, this level was going to transition us to farm. We would go all the way through to the dance where Ellie and Dina share their first kiss. Then we would play through farm and when Ellie plays the guitar at night, she would remember the Seth incident. So, the opening for this was a little tricky. We needed it to match at least a little what you might expect emotionally coming from prior beats because we were already purposefully disorienting you in time and space. Remember, you just came from this huge fight. To jump straight into it would have been a little too jarring. After some back and forth, we rooted it in Ellie's nerves, calling back to her hands shaking in the theater. But this time, for a much more innocuous reason, we'll find out later. She's nervous because she has a crush on Dina, who is the only reason why she's here at the dance. Something we really wanted to do was highlight the way their lives had turned upside down since she went down this path. We had this idea of recontextualizing all of our usual gameplay mechanics that were designed for really violent ends. The workbench, door bashes, throwable weapons, and even the infected, which is my personal favorite. Peppered throughout the level are moments of levity or shared history, 
all the while seeing how happy and mundane they all were before her huge revenge odyssey. We use our workbench a lot to make a lot of things that kill and maim and hurt people. Here, we had the silly idea of using the same feel, harkening back to the same animations, using the exact same UI to instead fix a drink. Like the workbench, you could pick your base and then you could add something to it. And at the time, we had some different reactions from Ellie based on how strong you chose to make the drink. Something we wanted to prototype though, before it got cut, was picking up some ingredients around to add like a lime or maybe a bottle of someone's favorite whiskey or salt, like you were earning upgrades. We also toyed with having Ellie carry around the drink you made and occasionally sip it, psyching herself up to go talk to Dina inside because she's nervous. It got too noodly though, because she would need to keep placing it somewhere before she did anything. So it would have ended up more trouble than it was worth. It is not a festival without one of these throwing games. This one, of course, uses our throwable system where you're often chucking explosive things or stunning things, but for a more wholesome purpose, although some people take this game really seriously. A fun aspect of this is if you did well, you could win a toy here. Ellie would place it in her pocket. If you had done this, you'd find the toy with JJ, the baby, later back at the farm. When we cut this, the toy made it through anyway because it was so cute. It is the same one you see on the tractor at the farm. Ollie the Elephant. The makeup artist is pretty simple. It's one of those little in-game scenes we peppered in to make it feel like Ellie had roots in the town. Hallie, our writer, mentioned that in her mind, an ex-girlfriend of Ellie's tattooed her arm to cover up her scar. So we figured this might be the only time you get to see that. We wanted to hint at it and allude to it and make it feel like there had been so much more that had been happening and so much more that Ellie threw away. This is one of my favorite sections because I think that it achieves both the slice of life aspect of Jackson while also being a stark reminder of how dark the world that they live in really, really is. To attract attention and curiosity, one of the kids was supposed to make this adorable, messed up little clicker impression, and the others would giggle. We tried a version where if you got close enough, the kid might try to follow you a little before turning back. Since clickers are blind and move by echolocation, for this game of messed up tag, Ellie must close her eyes and listen for when the children give themselves away. The thought was that these kids are in relative safety, they still grow up with the dangers of clickers and runners, and all those lessons would embed themselves in the games that they play. When the festival got cut, they tried to preserve this moment and move it to the front of the game where the snowball fight is, as a tutorial. However, being in the headspace of a clicker doesn't really teach you how to deal with them. Eventually, it evolved, and they instead made the snowball fight, which was, I think, way more effective. For me, it's character illuminating that not only does Ellie know this game, she plays along. There's a familiarity with the kids that's really nice to see, especially because it's such a difference from the Ellie we see later, who has a sort of hollow normalcy that she's trying to get with JJ, but kind of fails.
There's a hidden spot at the back that was just a bit of fun. It was highlighting Jackson's normalcy with something we would find in a real world. In the back, you would find teenagers finding some alone time with each other in a dark corner of a party. It was rewarding the player for peeking into a hidden corner, but ultimately redirecting them back to the festival. We also had versions of them smoking weed here, despite Maria's consternation, probably having gotten it from Eugene. The ladder acts as an immediate goal for the player, but being able to climb out is not going to be so easy. To keep levels interesting and engaging, we alternate between positive and negative values the player experiences. Here, it's a positive to have found the ladder, but then a negative to discover it's not the solution. But then another positive to identify the next short-term goal of the doorway. By alternating between these opposing values, we give players what they expect, but not how they expect it. This level, internally known as Fine Nora, was quite long in duration as we had to make Ellie traverse a far distance to the opposite side of downtown Seattle. The sewer section was originally longer than what we released the game with, approximately 10 minutes more. This was one of the few areas of the game that used water flow as part of a traversal puzzle. The player has to go upstream to use the current to get to the platform to reach the other side. We mostly cut this mechanic game wide, however it remained in essence in the section swimming to the aquarium as Ellie when you were avoiding the waves. When players reach the doorway and enter into the room, they're faced with a dead end. The real reason for this dead end here? room is that on the reversal when exiting back out of the doorway, players are faced with the route onwards. A pipe that they've not been able to see when they were swept past it on the way in, or something that was hidden from view when on the side platforms. The intention here being that the only option is to go off the standard path in order to search for a way out. Get me the hell out of here. Throughout the rest of the level, we also used light to indicate to the player that they were heading in the right direction. At each turn, however, we blocked the direct route forward. 
players would know that they just have to keep finding alternative paths, promoting those feelings of being desperate and trapped. We slowly introduce the player to consider climbing into smaller pipes and crouching in these tight out. spaces. This is to keep slowly build up, up to and encourage the player to climb into such small pipes that they'd have to be crawling on their stomach, which is something that the player previously may not have recognized as a playable space, let alone the desired route they need to take. We added a tiny space just to reward the player's exploration with a pickup item, and we made sure it was something that made sense it'd find in this area, a canister and all the garbage that had been washed into the sewers from the surface. We loved the idea of making Ellie prone through a tiny, dirty pipe in order to get out, as it was a great opportunity to oh, use our frame mechanic. Ellie. The unique camera setup was created to support crawling in these pipes, as the standard prone camera is much higher above the player. We also created custom collision in order for Ellie to maneuver in these tight spaces easily. Initially, the oblong collision capsule around her character caused issues crawling around corners. But we put extra effort into the custom corner collision, so the movement experience is as smooth as the main game. In order for the player to feel cramped, claustrophobic and desperate, we'd been enforcing the traversal mechanics that allow for a tight environment which promote these feelings. We introduced the use of the squeeze through so that we can keep the player feeling enclosed and tight, but without repeating the same geometry. Here we change from low ceilings with wider walls to high ceilings and tight walls to change up the spatial pacing and keep the level from repeating itself. Originally, we had the waterline much higher here, so players had to swim through this tight tunnel. However, from watching user test feedback, it was occasionally causing people to discount the route entirely and turn back on themselves. So to avoid any risk of this happening in the final game, we present a lower water level so the tunnel is easy to see and commit to using. Although this isn't as impactful without the prone swim, it's the better decision as it means a smooth experience for the player with no backtracking frustration. We draw the player towards this pipe as it is seemingly the route out of the tight space. Fairly soon, it is obvious that this path is blocked. If the player goes all the way up to the bars that block the path, they are rewarded with a pickup so this journey doesn't feel wasted. It is important to encourage the player to try to progress along this path so that they would subtly be thinking of progress in this direction. We hint to the player that there is a bigger, new space beyond this pipe by showing the player the waterfall. This helps players consider the other route where they don't know how far the tunnel is or whether they'd make it. As we surface from the water and over the crest of the slope, we reveal what is further in this tunnel, a clicker that has sprouted and the fungus has grown on the sides of the pipe. It was great to see people who user tested this area becoming increasingly worried as we forced the player to squeeze past the fungus and inches away from the clicker's face, all the time not being sure whether the clicker might be alive or attack them. Although we aren't as cruel as to force a clicker attack in such close proximity, we do have a payoff for this moment. This clicker momentarily turned into Joel to show Ellie's PTSD from what happened to Joel at the start of the game. Ultimately, we decided to save this moment for the farm level, as it was more impactful there because it could become the centerpiece of that experience. Whereas in the sewers, we weren't able to make it as much of a narrative point and give it the breathing room and reaction time that it deserves, given the tight space. Ah, oh shit. Ah. For the final section, we eventually opened you out into a wider area as you traverse through such tight spaces leading up to this. So changing the environmental pacing makes it begin to feel like we're coming to the end of Ellie's ordeal. An earlier iteration used the current that we'd shown at the start for a slightly tougher traversal puzzle to conclude the sewers. The ladder was clearly visible from most of the area, but the player was faced with a fast flowing torrent of water they couldn't cross. If the player attempted to jump into the water, they were not able to swim across the ladder due to the water's speed but instead they had to traverse the pipe running along the top of the space in order to get across the water. For the final section, we eventually opened you out into a wider area as you traversed through such tight spaces leading up to this. 
So changing the environmental pacing makes it begin to feel like we're coming to the end of Ellie's ordeal. An earlier iteration used the current that we'd shown at the start for a slightly tougher traversal puzzle to conclude the sewers. The ladder was clearly visible from most of the area, but the player was faced with a fast-flowing torrent of water they couldn't cross. If the player attempted to jump into the water, they were able to swim across the ladder due to the water's speed. But instead, they had to traverse the pipe running along the top of the space in order to get across the water. This is the first time we get to see stalkers that are embedded into the walls. So this optional room is a nice little early extra that the player gets if they explore. We also use the pickups to lure players over to be close enough to trigger the stalker's attack. And this caused quite a few jump scares with user testers who played our game before its release. Using this pipe was retained in the iteration we shipped with, as it's the last of the extreme methods Ellie has to undergo in order to escape the sewers, and what she will go through in her pursuit of revenge. The last ladder climb is quite lengthy, and although we could have trimmed it down to a shorter climb, we liked how this last segment of the journey built anticipation for whether there was success at the top or not after all you've been through. Ultimately, the ladder exits out into the subway station, which is how it connects in the final game. Ellie then has to find her way to the hospital from here, crossing paths with the scars for the first time. So the boar hunt was one of the hardest levels for me to work on. It was a huge challenge with the systems that we had, and we kept trying, but it never felt quite right. Originally, the, the level happened after the Jackson Festival, which also got cut, but before Farm. Once the festival got cut, it became the prologue to Farm. The intended experience is that we jump forward in time after the fight with Abby in the theater. We don't know where Dina is. We likely assume she's dead, because she was just bleeding out. Ellie is alone, her hair is short, so maybe this is the future or the present? And she's hunting. Hunting who? Abby still? In early iterations of the fight, it was more arena-like. The player slowly whittles down the boar's health. Ellie gets more visceral and more vicious. We get a little worried about her. As the boar gets weaker, more panicked, more feral, and we start feeling sympathetic to the boar was the hope. Uh, in all of these iterations, especially of these wider areas, it required custom AI and scripting to make sure it continued to feel organic as an animal, but we really needed it to do specific stuff. It needed to be Definitely able to close not. distances really, really quickly. It needed to charge to attack, but we wanted the feeling of hunting, so we needed to track it down from afar. And we also needed to discourage the player from attacking the boar when it's that close, or it would kind of turn into this melee kerfuffle. How do we do this in our world while keeping the boar believable? We must have gone through five or six iterations gotcha. of the boar fight and all, and every single time it changed pretty drastically. We split it into clear phases where one was like all long range. We tried another where you're getting close and you get the jump on it quite literally. You're jumping off of a rock <laughs> to attack it. Uh, and then finally, we tried a bunch where you almost so sort of uh, go around a bunch of trailers and try and, try and wrestle it. We uncovered after some time that taking down a boar over several phases felt very laborious and a little dramatic. It was comically long. It felt too boss-like, uh, a little too gamey. We decided to cut the first few phases and we opted for a cold open after the boar had already been hurt off screen. So that allowed us to focus on feeling like we're closing in on prey and to introduce the boar when it was at its most dangerous. Already hurt, 
already feral, much too close for comfort. And so the thinking was it would bring us more into Ellie's mindset. Is this really hunting for food or is she hunting for some other reason? The gas station was built to highlight the boar's destructiveness. Since it's cramped, the boar feels larger. We also feel trapped with it, though perhaps it's trapped with us. When it charges, it gets to us quickly, so we must be on our toes. This made it more aligned with Ellie's sort of hunting for trouble mindset. Listening became more important, as well as moving around slowly so it didn't hear you. Could you spot it before it saw or heard you? And could you get a shot off quickly enough so you could dodge out of the way? Or is the shot worth the cost after? It feels like a gamble. By the end of the fight, everything would likely be in shambles. The boar would burst through the back, and Ellie would follow it and finally enact revenge. Oh, I can't see shit. The boar kill was supposed to be anything but glorious. With the boar whimpering at the back of the gas station after Ellie's relentless hunt. After this, hearing the drone that we kind of come to associate with Ellie's trauma, we would hard cut to the stream where she's washing her hands and holding rabbits that she hunted, about to return to Dina. And there would be no mention of the boar. 